Hello and welcome to another Paro Seminar. Uh, this month we're going to look at uh, the difference between classical theology and radical theology and we're going to look at it particularly through the lens of the thinkers uh, Paul Tillich and Slavio Žižek. Although I'm going to add a third in because as I was preparing for this seminar I realized that the topic will be easier and more comprehensive if, the, if I compare and contrast three different thinkers who are very similar and yet with um, enough difference to make it interesting. So I'm also going to throw John Caputo into the mix. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, Paul Tillich, John Caputo, Slavio Žižek, see what they're doing, see how their projects um, are similar and how they're different. And at the end of this, as I say, I hope you'll have a sense of what classical theology is, a sense of what radical theology is in a clear way. I mean, we've been doing that for years, but we'll try and succinctly define it. And also, you'll have a good uh, key into understanding uh, these three thinkers. Now, of course, as a disclaimer, I want to say that each of these thinkers is complex and uh, have written a lot, and two of them are still alive, so their work is still developing. Um, and so although I'm going to kind of like parse out where the three are different, um, there are ways to, for example, read Tillich in a Caputian way or read uh, Caputo in a Shizekian way. Um, but the purpose of this seminar is to give a kind of introduction to the thinkers so that when you come to read them, you, kind of, you have some way to navigate it. You've kind of got a good starting point. Um, and it is around this notion of God as ground, God as gap, or groundless ground. Um, and so to begin with, I actually want to read the opening paragraph from this book by John Caputo, The Folly of God. This is a great text. All three of these writers, by the way, are very good writers, right? All excellent in different ways. So Caputo's strength is he's very playful with language. Uh, so he's always playing on signs and playing on etymology and uh, kind of deconstructing words in interesting ways. So he's a joy to read. This is a very short book, really recommend it. Um, and in the opening chapter, uh, or in the introduction, he gives a really nice way of thinking about the difference between confessional theology and radical theology. Um, and there are different confessional theologies and there are different radical theologies, but to kind of start to differentiate the two, this paragraph is useful. He says this. <clears throat> the real interest of theology is not God. At the end of the day, it is in the best interest of theology not to be content with God. <clears throat> theology has other interests. I will not say higher interests because that could, because what could be higher than God? God, after all, is the ends supremum the supreme being, the highest of them all. When we give glory to God, we regularly add in the highest. If we are to allow the interests of theology to be measured by who or what is highest, God comes out on top, hands down. That is a competition that prudence dictates I decline to enter. Instead, I will strike out in the opposite direction, conceding the high ground to the other side. <clears throat> Let's call that high theology. Theology that can have no higher interest in God. My contention is that theology has deeper interest than God. We could call the opposing tendency deep theology, but I prefer to call it radical theology, meaning getting down in the dirt and digging down into the roots of theology. <clears throat> so this is a really nice description of radical theology. <clears throat> One of the issues with the term radical theology is often that it, it, it speaks of roots. So you, know, you get this connotation of you're trying to get to the source. And what we're going to discover is that none of these thinkers, with the exception maybe of Tillich, right, but um, are trying to reveal some sort of deep source. What they're really about is going deep into the dirt of life going into the human experience. So instead of kind of like talking about something that is beyond us, something that is high above us, arguing for, an exist for or against the existence of God, 
they are taking as a starting point human experience, our embeddedness in the world. And the human experience is the experience of something transcendental, something that cannot be grasped, basically the unknown or the impossible, that part of the human experience is not being content with just the way things are. A rock is a rock, a dog is a dog, a snail is a snail. But a human is someone who asks what it is to be human. A human is someone whose being is in question. It's in question every time we do something, every time we decide to do one thing over another, to go out with friends or to visit someone who's sick or to take one job over another, whatever it is, every time we're making decisions, we're making decisions about who we are and what we are. To be human is to be a question to oneself, even if we never actually consciously question ourselves. Um, and that's what anxiety is in the Kierkegaardian sense. Anxiety is the sense that we don't know what we should do. Like it's not just that we are like another type of animal that just does what it does. It is what it is. We feel ourselves out of touch with ourselves. Uh, we are discordant with ourselves. And that's, a, that's an experience that's not connected to any particular religion, any particular belief. Uh, it's not connected to the belief in God or the belief that God doesn't exist or anything like that. This is a human experience. It is part of what it means to be a creature of language. And theology, radical theology, starts with that. That's one of the issues. Now, not only radical theology, other disciplines are also interested in this question. In philosophy, you see it in psychoanalysis. But radical theology is, it's not like the transcendent that is above us. It's the transcendent that is within life itself. Immanuel Kant called this the categorical imperative. So for Immanuel Kant, to be human is to experience a sense that there are some things that we ought to do no matter how painful they are to do, or there are some things that we should avoid doing, no matter how, uh, how much reward we'll get for doing the opposite. Right? So there's, there's a sense in which there is something unconditional, even if we never live up to it, but a question mark that kind of like uh, stops us in our tracks, that prevents us from, from purely being creatures of self-interest. Um, and this is what Kierkegaard again, after Kant calls freedom, Freedom is not so much something that you do, it's an experience that you have, an experience of being a little bit out of whack with the world, <clears throat> being out of joint. So, um, this is a, is a concern of theology. And whenever Tillich says that he's giving ground to the highest theology, confessional theology, that's interested in God as out there in the universe and talking about radical theology. We're talking about these kinds of questions. And uh, Tillich, Caputo and Shizek represent three theological approaches to this sense of the, the transcendent that is within the imminent, this, uh, this ungraspable dimension of life and how we understand that, how we orient ourselves to it. There are a couple of other ones. Process theology could be mentioned, but I'll put that to one side. But we're pretty, you know, three of the main uh, positions can be represented by these three thinkers. <clears throat> now, before we get to them, I just want to mention mystical theology for a second, or apophatic theology. Because apophatic theology uh, is a kind of theology that you could place in either side, right? Um, apophatic, the, to apoph, apophasis means to speak away from. We call it negative theology. Um, I think a really good translation of apophatic theology is discourse, dis dash course. So if you say dis dash course, you're saying that it's a discourse that sends you off course. And that's what apophatic theology does. It's a type of speaking that always frustrates. It, it, it's, it, it leaves unsaid as much as it says, and it, um, it revels in the unsaid and the unspeakable. And so sometimes mystical theology could be seen as the most sophisticated form of confessional theology, or, or one of the most sophisticated forms. In other words, God is the highest being in the universe, 
but we can never grasp that beam. So the language always falls short. Or you can see within some mystical thinkers like uh, Meister Eckhart, a sense of the rootedness that God is not the highest being, but rather apophatic thinking is designed to kind of prevent us from even that kind of notion of God as the highest being. So there's a kind of an atheistic dimension to the apophatic theology. So there's mystical theology and both confessional, classical theology and radical theology make use of that. Uh, but again, I'm going to put that to one side and then we'll get into the, th the three thinkers today. Um, each of these thinkers, by the way, have slightly different words to describe this dimension of uh, uh, the, uh, the impossible or the lack or the crack within reality, this sense of, of not at oneness. So Tillich you often uses words like uh, the unconditioned. Uh, Derrida, or with Caputo, who follows Derrida, Caputo uses the word undeconstructible. And uh, Shizek would use the word real. And they've got a number of words, but there's just three different ways of, of beginning to kind of talk about this dimension of, dimension of life. And for Caputo and for all of them, this is theological because theology has always been interested in the ungraspable, in the transcendent, and in how that dimension impacts us. But what's interesting again about these three thinkers is they're not starting with a position that you have to believe something in order to understand, right? So um, if you're doing classical theology, you start maybe with a belief in God, right? There is a highest being, and then you know you, know, you talk about what that being is, et cetera, et cetera. These uh, thinkers are talking about, they're trying to isolate a universal experience that everybody can relate to. This is not within the confines of the theism or Pan pantheism or atheism or anything like that. It's a universal human experience that you will find anywhere that you find speaking beings. Okay, so let's outline Tillich. Uh, for Paul Tillich, um, he talks about God as the ground of being, right? And what he means by this is he says that Human beings are driven. We are driven by what he calls ultimate concern. We, even if we don't think we are, there's always an ultimate concern. There's always something that's animating us, questions that are animating us. And this can be most easily seen in kind of paradynamic figures. Like for the philosopher is interested in truth. The artist is interested in beauty. The ethicist is interested in morality, right? And they're interested in capturing these, talking about them, discussing them. So two philosophers might sit down and talk about what is truth? And even is there truth? Uh, what does it mean to talk about truth, right? These are questions that philosophers will discuss and debate. Now Tillich says that at the realm of knowledge, at the realm of coming to a worldview, that will always be able to be critiqued that will always fall short. It'll always be full of ruptures and holes and gaps. But to be able to have that conversation, you already have to presuppose truth. So you're already standing on some sort of shared ground, even if you disagree. So if you're arguing about whether there is truth, the, for that argument to make sense, you have to both tacitly be standing on truth Truth is not something that you argue towards, it's what you argue from, right? You stand on it and you argue from there. And then the words that you create and the systems you create are attempts perhaps to understand what you're standing upon, but they're not what you're standing upon. They're never the same thing. So for Tillich, when he talks about God as the ground of being, what he's talking about is he's talking about something that again think of ground like Caputo talks about the earth something that out of which everything arises that is not an object that we can grasp because as soon as I talk about something I talk about this can I'm holding it's an object that I can reflect on that I can analyze in different ways um, and I can understand in different ways if I'm an artist or a designer I can look at the uh, 
the images that are on the can and judge whether I think it's well designed. If I if I'm a type uh, do typography, I'd be interested in the lettering and the font. If I'm uh, you know in some sort of manufacturing, I might be interested in the material of the can, etc. So there's various ways that I can that I can analyze this can, um, but I'm making it into an object. The ground is not an object or a subject. The ground is that out of which subject and object arise. So everything arises out of a ground. And if, you, if it sounds too abstract, it's that notion of truth again. The two, are, the two philosophers are talking about what is truth. To make sense of that, they're both grounded in a, in a notion of truth. Otherwise, they couldn't talk. There'd be no way to communicate. There'd be no way to trust what they, they have to say. So there's this grind, and out of this grind comes everything. And that grind does not, properly speaking, exist, because to exist is to be an object. And properly speaking, the grind is not some object that we can grasp. Um, it is that out of which we arise. And this allows Tillich to have this really kind of, you know, thoughtful and very careful sense of how we interact with the world, with ethics, for example. So the idea is that, yes, we are driven by and we are animated by a ground. Now, often that we hide from that. We, it's only a, a, a very small whisper in our lives. But something that kind of tells us that, you know, just giving ourselves over to everyday life and to Netflix is not enough, right? There's something deeper. So there's this, there's this sense of a ground and at the same time the idea that we can never grasp what that ground is so for Tillich he's always trying to move between scientism and superstition scientism which would basically say there is no kind of like a unconditional element to reality there is nothing uh, no categorical imperative no dimension of freedom um, that, that actually exists in reality. And then on the other side, superstition, which kind of says there is and then reduces it to an object, is that can be manipulated, talked to, uh, cajoled, et cetera, et cetera. So Tillich is trying to move between the one dimensionality of the profane world of the scientific and the, the, the religious world of superstition, which he calls kind of the mythological world. Um, for him, religious discourse at its best gives a type of uh, uh, don't want to, I don't like to use the word third way but transcends both of these positions and the way it does it is for example you give yourself to an ethical cause right if you you know you're trying to act in the world you see injustice and you want to be an instrument for good and you want to be someone who benefits the world right so you've got this desire uh, Tillich would first of all say, right, so you're now in this, this you've, you've got a feeling of ultimate concern, but now your danger is that you think that the way you see the world is the way the world is. Your way of doing justice is correct. The people who disagree with you are wrong and um, demonic and evil, right? Uh, so you're so taking your sense of justice to be the way justice is. And he says that's demonic. Right. Demonic is whenever you take this feeling of the ground that you are animated by and you make it into an idol. And that's where you make your country say into right or wrong, I'll die for my country, whatever it is. So for Tillich, what one has to do is you give yourself to ethical causes, but always with fear and trembling and realizing that the way you see this is not the ultimate way it is. And that allows you to be open to the other, to engage in discourse to the other. So the, the kind of the evidence that you're not in, in the demonic is the extent to which you don't see the people who disagree with you as some sort of evil thing that you write off with, with certain language. Like in the McCarthy era, the, the word was communist, right? Anybody you didn't like was a communist and that was a way to completely write off the other. So Tillich says, not that you don't fully give yourself to something, absolutely, that's ultimate concern, that you feel there's something that you will die for and live for, that's ultimate concern, but you, it doesn't become demonic 
uh, when you also very fully go, this is my symbolic way of understanding justice, right? It's not justice in itself. I could be wrong. In fact, I'm very definitely wrong. I just hope I'm on the right tracks. I hope that what I'm doing is causing more good in the world than bad. So always beware of people who define themselves as like doing good in the world, um, you know, without saying, without that, that in brackets, perhaps, the, the brackets of, well, actually, perhaps I'm an instrument of, of suffering. There's a great sketch by Mitchell and Webb that you should look up where it's Second World War and there are two SS guards and they're, they're in some bunker in Russia and they're talking about how they're moving forward and they're defeating the Russians. And then one of the SS guys goes, have you ever noticed what's on our caps? I was like, well, well what, no, like, what, what do you mean? He says, well, we've got skulls on our caps. It's like, yes, yeah, so what? And the guy's like, like, are we the baddies, right? Now that's the beautiful insight, is the realization that I could be the baddie. And then the whole sketch, there's a number of sketches are all by them realizing that they're the baddies. That is um, a good thing for us to bear in mind for Tillich, is that we think we're doing profound good in the world, but if we're not open to the other, to, to listening to difference, we will probably end up potentially doing something bad. So all of Tillich's work and, and his book, the uh, My Search for Absolutes, is a very simple and beautifully um, articulated version of this, where he says that theology at its best connects us with our ultimate concern, reveals our drive for the truth, for beauty, for ethics, while at the same time creating a profound humility that uh, the way we understand those things is, is related to our upbringing, the books that we've read, uh, the study that we've done, etc, etc. Now, one of the key elements of Tillich in all of this is that the unstable dimension of our understanding of truth and beauty and justice, right? That's unstable. In Derrida's terms, that's deconstructible, right? You can tear it apart with that eternal, you know, you'll, you'll never, no one will ever get to the point where they've nailed that down. But that relatively unstable discourse that we need, that's required, I mean, till it's like, you can't do without it, right? That we are creatures of language. We need these unstable shelters these unstable kind of lenses through which we see the world. But for Tillich, this unstable uh, uh, shelter is grounded in, in something stable, something that is indutable. And so in his book, The Courage to Be, it's a beautiful book that very slowly goes through various forms of anxiety, the anxiety of death, the anxiety of guilt, and finally, the anxiety of meaninglessness. And Tillich at the end of that says, when you go into the anxiety of the sense that everything is meaningless, which is for him, we live in that age. Uh, the previous ages, the primary anxiety was death or guilt. Today, although all of those are in existence, the primary form of anxiety in the kind of late 20th century was the sense of meaninglessness. He says, you go deep enough into that, you find that you're standing on something meaningful. Even asking the question, is everything meaningless, shows that there is some meaning, even if the meaning is simply to ask that question. So what happens for Tillich is always your unstable world, you, you get this sense in which it rests on something stable. So there is hope. When you give yourself to love and to truth and to justice, when you try to be kind in the world, when you try to do the right thing, you might not be doing the right thing, but you can be sure that um, that, that desire is grounded in something that is greater than death, greater than uncertainty. There is something that, that out of which all of this comes. And again, just to reiterate, his danger is that we, reduce, we make that ground of being into an object, then that's demonic, superstitious, occultic. Or we just completely um, think that these questions are nothing. We, we try to kill that, that sense of questioning, that sense of desire for the good, the true and the beautiful. We, we, 
we reduce it to some sort of um, you know uh, you know like uh, love of something you know instead of real art we just uh, you know content ourselves with the kind of stuff we get in IKEA or whatever it is right um, and we, we render the world one dimensional until it wants to say no you feel this ultimate concern theology is there to fan that to help you feel it to help it kind of like make its presence felt in your life and also to protect you from thinking that you can grasp it and of course there's lots of theological language that basically speaks about god as the unnameable um the you know that has religious language it's like mystical language protecting us okay so that's paul tillich Paul Tillich, like all of these thinkers, and like, like people like Simone Weil and Dietrich Bonhoeffer as well, there's loads of them, they're talking about an experience that we feel in the world, whatever position we take, it's there, it's, a, it's universal. And he sees this as a theological thing. And he says that this feeling rests upon an ultimate ground, and he calls that the God beyond God, the ground of being, the God beyond God, that we all experience to some extent in our lives and theology is simply trying to draw out that we're estranged from that and to in a way give ourselves over to it secondly then we're going to move on to John Caputo John Caputo um, is influenced by uh, Derrida and post-structuralism and, he's, and his, his stuff is very similar to Tillich, right? All of these are very similar. So, so Caputo loves this notion of what he would use the term the deconstructible, that everything that we say can be deconstructed, can be pulled apart. Uh, he uses something that Derrida talked about, which is the difference between justice and law. Justice is the, gr- is, well, in Tillich's terms, the ground. Justice is the that which inspires the pursuit of law, right? So the law is trying to be just. But the law is when you write it down or when you put it into words. So all we have is the law. As human beings, all we have is law. We try to write down what justice is. We try to speak justice. And when we speak it and when we write it and when we conceive it, we are left with the law, not justice. And that's why the law can always be unjust and will always to some extent be unjust, right? It might work and it might be helpful, but eventually a case is gonna come up that um, doesn't fit within the current system of the law. So the law has to either be reinterpreted or a new presence set, right? So the law is always changing. It's deconstructible, which means it's always developing, it's always changing. We give it incredible credence because it is the coagulation of the wisdom of millions of people over time thinking about what justice is. So it's the coagulation of justice through in within history. So we give it a lot of credence, but it's never quite justice. So it has to be rethought and redeveloped and reinterpreted for the future. Now here's the key for Derrida is that all we have is the law, we never have justice. But without the law, we'd have no way of even thinking about justice. So the law is our only access to justice. So weirdly, the law doesn't give us justice, but negatively speaking, apophatically speaking, we get a sense of justice through the law. And So without the law, we'd have no sense of justice at all. So law and justice operate in this way, uh, justice being the un the deconstructible. So Caputo goes with Tillich, and in fact, this book, The Folly of God, is mostly a a love letter to Paul Tillich until about halfway through when he then says, right, now I'm going to go a slightly different way. And this is where they differ. Caputo ultimately argues that Tillich has too substantive a notion of God still. So if classical theology has this very substantive notion of God as a being, as an object that we can talk about and discuss, or as a subject that, that, that objectifies us, Paul Tillich avoids all of that, right? He avoids all of that, but there's still a certainty. Whenever you read Tillich, Tillich is not a theologian or a philosopher of uh, doubt. He is a philosopher and theologian of certainty. Um, and by the way, I wanted to say this, all three of these are philosophers and theologians. All three of these also 
uh, blur those boundaries in really interesting ways. But Tillich is a philosopher and a theologian of the indubitable. There is something, so everything can be doubted, everything can be deconstructed. If ever you think that you have the answer, you don't kill the answer, right? If you see the, if you see the answer on the road, kill it, right? Just like Buddha said, if you see the Buddha on the road, kill him, because it's not the Buddha. The Buddha is everywhere, not in just one particular location. If you ever see the answer, you know, sitting in your armchair, you gotta get rid of it, right? Because you don't have it, because the answer is not something you can grasp. The answer, is, the answer you give is always conditional on something deeper. But Caputo wants to say that actually theology is more terrifying than that, brings us to a more terrifying conclusion. And the more terrifying conclusion is we don't know if there's anything solid beneath our feet. Uh, theology is simply the experience of the call itself. And he makes a distinction between Tillich, who talks about the unconditioned, and Caputo, who uses the word the unconditional with Derrida, the unconditional, right? So the unconditioned is, is Tillich. He's saying there is something that is unconditioned. We can't speak it, but it's unconditioned. It has no conditions and it, everything arises out of it. And Caputo says, no, 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 there's an unconditional dimension to reality. But we, but we can't say anything about a conditioned thing, a conditioned ground. In other words, all we can say is that there is a call to truth and to beauty and to, to justice. And the, the role of religion is to sensitize us to that call. The role of theology is to sensitize us to this dimension of, uh, of something greater and better that we don't have, but without any guarantees that there's something that grinds all of that. All we have is the unconditional dimension, not an unconditioned reality. So for Tillich, we have hope, right? We know that even if, even if you're doing evil things in the name of justice, you've got hope there's still justice, right? You may have screwed up, but you can still believe in the ultimate notion of uh, transcendental justice. For Caputo, it's like, no, you, you don't have any, um, any guarantees. So he calls it hoping against hope, right? You give yourself over to these things without guarantee. Now, it's kind of interesting because that allows Caputo to say that there is no economic value to theology. Because if there is a grind that you can be certain of, to some extent, it's economic sense to give yourself over to it because you're giving yourself over to the ultimate reality, right? And um, you'd prefer to do that than not, right? But for Caputo, you don't know. It's not even you don't know. that That's not a question you can even ask. All there is is this call to the good and without economic exchange, right? Without any kind of like potential reward. You just give yourself over to it and everything might be a disaster. Everything might go wrong. The universe might all just go into pure nothingness. And then Caputo would say, brilliant, all the better. If you can imagine that and still say yes to the call of the good, then that's the true theological movement. That's the true warrior, right? And I, uh, warrior is probably not the type of word he would use because he talks about weak theology, but it is a warrior. It's a, it's a courage. It's a courage to fight for something with no guarantees, hoping against hope. So that's why in, in the description for this seminar, I think I mentioned that for someone like, well, Shizek, but for Caputo as well, uh, Tillich's God is too substantive. The ground is too substantive. Um, and therefore, there's a danger of economy, a danger of like making a prudent decision, treating theology and faith like we would a good investment, right? In, uh, and not just a good investment, an investment that guarantees some sort of result. Now, that's not completely true because for remember for Tillich, you can give yourself over to the good and actually you've done evil, right? You can think that you're doing, you're, you're in the service of beauty and truth and goodness and you're not. So there is a total danger in what Tillich's saying. This is not pure economy in Tillich, right? 
right? Not at all. But at its, at its very base, there is a little bit of that, right? So yeah, we could be wrong, we could be doing it wrong, but the one thing we can be sure of is truth, beauty, and the good. And Caputo was saying, no, listen, you've got to, you've got to knock that out as well. There's, so it, it's a philosophy, we can't get into it, but that kind of says that that position is not reasonable. You could, that's not a reasonable position to have. And you wouldn't even want it. That there is something so profoundly, uh, let's call it theological or faith. Faith is a profound um, giving yourself over to love without any guarantee. That's, that's kind of what the life of faith is. The life of faith is a type of life without guarantee for Caputo. For Tillich, there's a type of guarantee in it. For Caputo, there's no guarantee. And if you think about it like being in a relationship where you maybe know that's probably going to go wrong, you see all the people you know who have broken up, you, you've seen how um, uh, things, that, you know, people even who don't break up don't end up talking with each other and hating each other and all of that. You fully accept that and yet you still say yes to the relationship, right? There's something of faith and folly. This is why this book, by the way, is called The Folly of God because there's something foolish about that, right? Like we all want an economic exchange. We all want to try to be prudent investors in life. Uh, but Caputo was saying that faith is, is an ultimate folly um, because you're making a decision with no guarantee that completely being taken away in advance. A beautiful movie on that is Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind where actually the two characters, they fall in love, they end up hating each other and they go to a company that can wipe out the memory of someone. So they wipe out their memories of each other and then they repeat this cycle. And eventually they discover that they've repeated the cycle. Someone shows them the files, going like, you've fallen in love before. It ends up terrible. It ends up destructive, etc., etc. And um, it kind of ends with them basically going, who cares? I mean, we're going to do it again. Right? That's the folliness of love <laughs> without guarantee. Um, actually, that film probably fits more with She's Exposition, so we'll maybe come back to that. But okay, so that's Caputo, and that's she sex. So I hope that's given you some sense of the difference. They're very similar. There's a there's a sense of constructiveness to everything we think. There is a sense of the undeconstructible, something deeper, something more grounded that we cannot grasp that that inspires us. But for Tillich, this is a substantive, unconditioned reality. For Caputo, it's not really deeper. It's it's to, all we have as a call to be human is to experience this call without any sense that we are standing on a ground. So for, for Caputo, it's a groundless grind. Tillich, God is the ground of being. Caputo, God is the groundless grind of being. And then finally, Shizek. So where does Shizek fit with all of this? Um, in some ways, Shizek can be seen to have an element of both of these thinkers, right? Um, Shizek is, like, like these other two, talking about a dimension of reality that is ungraspable that he calls following Lacan the real, right? Or a parallax. There's a parallax dimension of reality, which means you look at reality in one way, you see one thing, you change your perception, it changes, right? There's a... There's this um, not at oneness of reality with itself. So Shizek is fully on board with all of that. Shizek is closer to Tillich in that Shizek wants to say that we can come to an understanding of the very nature of reality. So what Caputo was basically saying is that question is just cut from under us. All we know is that there is this sense of incompleteness in the world, a call for the better. We give us to a utopia that will never arrive, right? A Messiah who will never come, right? So there's a Jewish dimension to this, waiting for the Messiah. You're waiting for the future. And as you actively wait, you also long for that. You also bring it into being in your waiting, right? So that's the, the Caputian Deridean thing that the utopia, the kingdom of God, is always to arrive. The Messiah is always uh, about to arrive, but never does. Um, for Shizek, 
it's more Christian in the sense that the Messiah has arrived. Um, the there's something there is something we can know. We have access to reality, but what we have access to is an insight into the non-oneness of reality with itself. Right. So let's put it like this: if if Tillich would say that contradiction in life, right? Contradictions and deadlocks in our everyday life are a symptom of the incompleteness of our pictures of reality, right? So the fact that our our worldviews, our systems are always at some level contradictory, eventually fall apart, right? Is evidence that they are not capturing the ground. So the ground is without contradiction. The ground is is the, that out of which everything arises and everything that arises eventually falls into deadlocks and contradictions, right? Every system has these elements of weakness where they crack. What uh, Kant called um, aporius, where, I mean, basically Kant said, you can really think about things deeply and you'll come to the idea that we can have free acts and you can equally well come to the conclusion that we're determined. You can come to the conclusion that the universe has a beginning or that the universe is eternal, that God exists or that God doesn't exist. So these are, ve- or that the, the universe is infinitely divisible or that you'll finally get to something that can't be divided. And so basically what Kant says is thinking comes to these contradictions. And Tillich would say, yeah, these contradictions exist because we can't get access to reality, to the ground. Caputo might say that uh, all we have is these contradictions and we don't, we don't have any access to some non-contradictory ground, right? That's just the, not a question. All we have is this, this sense of the, the world in its constructed form and it's, uh, uh, that can be deconstructed. And we have a sense of something undeconstructable, a promise. So when we talk about democracy, Democracy is, de- is deconstructible. We can always deconstruct how we do democracy. Every country that has democracy does it differently. And it can always be improved and changed, right? But in the word democracy, in the activity of democracy, there is the promise of what Derrida calls a democracy to come. So there's always like a promise of a, of a better democracy. It'll never arrive. The promise of a better democracy is formed through the failures of democracy. Right? So there's the failures of democracy and then you have a sense of a democracy to come. And, and through giving ourselves over to that notion of a democracy to come, we improve democracy as it currently exists, it exists in its actually existing form. So for Tillich, there's contradiction in reality but not on the ground. For Caputo, there's contradiction in reality and there is no ground that we can speak of. That's, that's not something that um, uh, we have any access to. And then for Shizek, there is contradiction in the ground itself. That we can come to know the ground through philosophy and, and uh, also we can do it existentially in various ways and in, in science as well. There's various ways to, to come to, to see this. But that there is a ground and the ground is not at one with itself. And the examples I've used before uh, but are in, like, in, in the example of physics, you have quantum indeterminacy where wave particle duality seems to suggest that reality itself is in a type of duality, indeterminacy. In mathematics, you have incompleteness theorem, which shows that mathematics itself seems to fall into a type of internal contradiction when it tries to totalize its own axioms. Uh, In biology, we have evolution, and evolution is the idea that organisms are not at one with their environment and not at one with themselves, that there is a type of not at oneness that then creates all this complexity. Um, and in philosophy it's called absolute knowledge the notion that the contradictions that we experience in our everyday lives point to some sort of contradiction in thought and being itself and that's what Shizek is saying 
So it's a kind of little bit of a mix of, there's a little bit of Caputo-esque stuff there because there is a type of, there's not a substantive ground. There is no guarantees. There is this kind of pure hoping against hope. But it's also got a Talikian element because this is saying, this is not just because we have no way of, uh, the question of metaphysics doesn't apply. Metaphysics meaning the, the science of what lies within or beyond physics. Um, but she says, no, we can't. Metaphysics is a legitimate uh, uh, science. It's almost like the difference between Hegel and Kant, where Kant says that the noumenal God in the realm of the beyond of, of physics is outside of reality, and Hegel says, no, it's within reality, and we can encounter it. Now, Caputo agrees with that, but, but I say, Shizek has a more substantive notion. So again, if I put the three side by side, you would say Tillich has a substantive notion of God as ground. Uh, Caputo has a substantive less notion of God as groundless. And uh, Shizek has a notion of the substance having within itself something that prevents it from being one. So it's a subst substantive substantivelessness, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, all right. I think that uh, I, I kind of hope, that's why I wanted, by the way, you'll notice I, the three of them I think kind of might make it easier to understand, although I know it's quite complicated. But I, I think I've kind of touched on what I, a, a good hermeneutic key for understanding how these three thinkers approach the, what theology is and what religious language is. And it, it cashes out slightly differently. I'll finish with this, how, how it looks different for each of them. Um, Okay, so you would say about Tillich is that we are constantly moving forward, uh, trying to uh, uh, improve in our understanding of truth and beauty and goodness, and always failing, but that failure is generative, it's productive. And what, what Tillich wants to do is say that that always has to be connected with the ground. When it gets disconnected from the ground, it becomes occultic or superstitious or scientistic and um, ordinary. Uh, kind of one-dimensional. Caputo is very close to that. Uh, he's saying that we give ourselves to the, 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 the life of faith. So, yeah, for Tillich, the life of faith is giving ourselves over to beauty, truth, and goodness with a sense of the guarantee that we are part of the nature of reality itself. We are connecting with the ground of being. For Caputo, you give yourself over as much as you can to the good, the beautiful, and the true with no guarantee, with no sense that there is a, uh, it's, an, it's a prudent investment. <laughs> um, there is sheer, pure risk. One's hope, the next is hoping without hope. And then for Shizek, this is interesting. He says, you're not always moving towards a utopia that you can't get. There's something about when you can embrace the contradictions of reality you are living within the, rev the, the, the kingdom of God. So it's not like the kingdom of God is always to come. It's the kingdom of God is here in the embrace of contradiction itself. So funnily enough, Shizek, I think, has uh, in some ways a, a kind of more positive reading than Caputo and, and Tillich because it's not that we're always moving towards something you can never get. That is true. Like there'll always be movement as long as there is life. But there isn't what's called an end of history. And it is a community that is able to embrace contradiction as part of the very nature of reality. That insight, existentially embraced, will help us, will help free us from damaging ways of relating to the world, to other people, and to ourselves. Whatever environment we're in, we will live in a healthy, joyful way. And that's salvation. And in any historical epoch, that's going to look different. But that experience, if, if, if that is uh, ruled out enough, then we, I think for Shizek would say, we can imagine a society that is, uh, that will always be changing, but that actually um, is not oppressive, that is emancipatory, emancipatory that is, um, that is, uh, that, that has justice built into its heart. Okay, so um, 
every, I mean, the reason why I'm hesitating so much every time I say things is because each of the thinkers is complicated and, you know, each of them overlaps. And uh, it's, what I want to do is pick out the differences, but sometimes the differences are very minute. And um, uh, I want to make sure that if those thinkers were hearing me speak, they could see themselves in what I'm saying. Um, but, the, but yeah, that kind of like unpicking that difference, that slight difference between the kingdom of God is to come and the kingdom of God is here in our desire for it to come. Um, they're all trying to kind of like articulate what that means. Uh, Shizek is more in the psychoanalytic tradition because in psychoanalysis there is an end. Like if you imagine, maybe I'll say it like this, a Caputian psychoanalysis might never end. It would be like, or it might be like going to church all your life. There's no end to it, right? You always are doing it. You keep yourself open to a future, right? Whereas in kind of psychoanalysis, there is an end. There's not an end to life. There's not an end to you living your life. You'll keep doing that until you die. But there is an end to analysis. And the end to analysis is when you encounter the contradiction of reality at the core of being, and you're able to be comfortable with that. Then you don't need the analysis anymore. So maybe that's the difference, is that, that Shizek is saying, no, there is a kind of uh, end point. Um, there's a type of theological cure. And maybe Caputo being more Catholic would say, well, no, you give yourself to church all your life. You're part of the community. And I mean, that is the cure for Caputo, but it's not like a, an event, like the Protestant conversion. It's the Catholic kind of like you're part of the rituals for, for all of your life. So I think actually that's a useful way of doing it. She's like the atheist Protestant, kind of is more inclined to a type of conversion, a type of salvationary moment. And then you can kind of walk away from the church. And Caputo is more of a Catholic atheist of sorts. Um, by the way, they're all a bit atheistic and theistic. Um, but uh, Caputo would be like more, yes, this is a, the cure is just this continual openness to the, the incoming of the Messiah who never actually arrives. Okay, I'm going to look to see if there's any questions. Um, hopefully some of you have survived all of that. Let's see. Oh, right, there's actually not too many here. Kate's asked a question, yeah. So how does the concept of sin look to th the three? Are they similar? That's very good. Um, yeah, that's very good because that's actually something I've talked to Caputo about. Uh, uh, for Capu so for Shizek, um, how would you talk about the notion of sin here? Um, so, well, for Shizek, there is an original sin, an original lack. Uh, for Caputo, there isn't. Um, but yeah, well, I wonder if that relates to what I'm saying, or is that, if that's just different. Let me think for a second. Um, yeah, because one of Caputo's issues with me, like a friendly issue, but we were discussing where he says like Pete's very into this sense of which the child is born into the world and experiences this, this lack and it's all very difficult. And he says, you know, he goes like, you know, I think of the kid as being born into this beautiful world and looking at the, 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 the butterflies and thinking everything's wonderful, right? And, uh, you know, that's, uh, uh, that's the difference between Shizek and Caputo. I, um, I don't know if it relates to this too much, but for Shizek, there is a trauma of a fun, yeah, there is a trauma of a fundamental rip in reality that we overcome by reconciling ourselves with. So that's the Shizekian thing, is there's a fundamental rip in reality, that's original sin, original fall, and original lack. That's in the core of reality. And the theological cure is in reconciling ourselves with that lack. Whereas Tillich would say there is no fundamental rip in reality. There is a fundamental, I suppose, rip in reality between the ground of being and being. So that can never be bridged. But but there is not some sort of ontological lack, right? There's a substantive notion of God as ground. And then Caputo would position himself here in the middle somewhere where he would say that, um, that we can't talk about ground. We can't talk about the ultimate ground, the substantive, or that the ultimate ground has, has a lack within it. Um, that question is not one is not is you know the the very nature of language 
means that that we don't have access to that. That's not a quid. Access is wrong because if I say there's no access to it, it makes you think, oh, it's there. We just don't have access to it. But Caputo wants to say something stronger, which is all we have is the unconditional call. So yeah, so maybe you would say that that that's the difference. Where where the where the where the rip is, where where the original sin is. For Tillich, it's between the ground of being and being. For Shizek, it's within being itself. And for Caputo, he thinks all of this is too metaphysical, and we uh, we shouldn't you know concern ourselves with it.